Hi, and welcome back once again to another video lecture on economics. As you can see, we are starting a new unit called microeconomics. And let's go ahead and get started since we only got 15 minutes. Um, the first thing we need to understand is what is the definition of, of microeconomics. And as you can see here, um, what we're studying in microeconomics is the economic behavior of sort of the individual, of you and me, how consumers, producers, Yes, this is demand and supply, how different businesses um, make economic decisions. So we're focusing on the small scale. And like you can see from the picture, we're looking at one individual tree of the forest. The forest being, of course, the bigger picture of economics, which will come in the next unit, macroeconomics. So without any further ado, let's get started. With the first major concept, and that is supply. Here's your definition of supply. And as you can see, there are two key aspects or characteristics of supply, willingness and ability. Um, and let me quickly define those. Ability assumes that you actually have access to the factors of production, the land, labor, capital, and entrepreneur that you would need to produce a product, and obviously the skills necessary to use those factors of production. We just make the assumption that obviously anyone that can supply a product has the ability. And of course, willingness is obviously that you're motivated, that you want to produce the product. And you can see here that motivation, of course, in our economic system is profit. Um, and we'll talk about that in much more detail in just a minute. Um, so here's the main question. What drives producers, as it says, to, to produce things? Why, do, why does McDonald's make hamburgers? Why does the Gap make jeans? And why does, of course, um, Apple produce new phones every six months? And the simple reason, of course, like we said before, is profit. Um, they want to make money. And that's reinforced by what Adam Smith called self-interest, and that drives our economic system of capitalism, as we're all pretty well aware. Um, so one of the most important things you need to do when you talk about supply is you need to think like a producer. And remember, a producer is always mo motivated by profit. Everything they do is in their own self-interest to try to improve how much money they make. This is one of the most challenging things for uh, students to do, that when they look at supply questions and issues that they think about, from a producer's perspective, because we're all very used to thinking like consumers because we buy things all the time. But most of us do not have a lot of experience in our own lives being producers. So keep this in mind. This is critical. So again, the assumption is for a producer is if they can produce more, they assume they can sell what they produce and obviously make more money. That's really the only reason they will produce more is because it will make them more money. So here's a quick little um, quote I'd like you to read. And it shows you how far producers are willing to go in order to try to make profit. That companies like Walmart have realized that stocking specific products and specific subcategories of products, including Pop Tarts, can make them a lot more money. And so, obviously, that's exactly what they do. But that's how focused they are on making profit and how focused they are on making sure they have just the right product. There's something called the law of supply, which is, like it says, a law, a rule that it must be followed. Okay, it's very simple. It says simply that if the selling price, and when we talk about price supply, man, we're talking about the selling price, the price that is being sold to consumers, you and I. If the selling price goes up, then the amount being produced or the quantity will go up as well. And so basically a higher selling price results in a higher quantity being produced. And that is key. As it says, another way to say this is that suppliers will uh, have an ability and to sell more of a good if the price goes up. This is saying the same thing as the first one, but it's worth repeating in a different way. One last thing, and here's the, the way to really remember it. There is this relationship between the selling price and the quantity. It very, very simply says that the amount that a producer is willing to make will change in the exact same way as the price. So, in this case, if the price were to go up for some reason, then the quantity supplied will go up, and the reverse would be true as well. If the price would go down for some reason, then the quantity supplied would go down. The key thing here is that producers respond to a change in price. You have to get rid of the assumption that producers control price, because as you know, if they did, they would charge a whole lot more for their goods and services. And we know that Starbucks, again, doesn't charge $1,000 for a cup of coffee because there's competition. So producers, to some degree, 
have to respond to changes in price. They have some control over price, and we'll talk about that. But right now, for the most part, take take it on my word that producers respond to a change in price rather than like many people think they just set it. There's something called a supply schedule, a very simple and obvious thing. It just basically lists the quantity that will be produced or provided at different price levels. So here you go. Here is our product, stuffed animals, and you can see a list. Okay, here's the price, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, etc. And you can see here's the quantity being produced. At $5, they produce zero. At $10, they produce 100 stuffed animals, and so on. The key here is to notice, of course, is that there's a direct relationship. As the price rises from $5 to $50, the quantity rises from zero all the way to 900. That fits with the law of supply that we just went over. Um, you won't draw a lot, you won't be using supply skills directly, but they lead to something else that you will use a lot, and that's called the supply curve. This is one of the first graphs that you'll be doing that I'll be showing here in a minute. So basically, it's a supply schedule that's just in a graph form. So here it is. A few things that you know very quickly. It's a, obviously, it's a, a, a y and an x axis for you math people. On the vertical, we have price always. On the horizontal, we have quantity. Those need to be labeled every time you draw a graph. As you can see, the supply graph okay, slopes upward to the right. Okay, Notice it's labeled S. We don't have the right supply, but an S is excellent. Okay, And what this basically shows us, it shows us that at this price, okay, say this is $5, the quantity would be something like 10. And then if the price went to $20, the, price, the quantity produced would be 20. And as you can guess, if the price goes up to 30, the quantity produced would be 30 as well. But again, it shows that direct relationship. As price goes up, the quantity being produced will go up. And that again reinforces the idea of the law of supply, which is key. You will be drawing um, supply graphs um, throughout the course and we'll be working with that in class uh, next time we meet. Oh yes, and again I just reiterate what I just said. Moving on. One thing that can happen is the graph can change. One of the first major ways it can change is called movement along the curve. Okay, And what you see here are different points on the curve. And all this is saying is something that we've kind of already stated, that if the price changes, then there will be a change in the quantity supplied in the same direction. So for example, if we're sitting here at $2, $20, excuse me, and we're producing 20 units, if the price were to drop okay, to, say, go down here from $20 to say this is $10, the quantity would drop as well. So whatever happens to the price in terms of it, if it goes down, the quantity goes down. If the price goes up, the quantity will go up. This is called movement along the curve. Okay. Okay. Again, it reinforces the idea that we have this direct relationship. But notice the quantity changes because of the change in price. The quantity, the, the amount produced is a response or a reaction to the price of the overall product. And again, anytime there's a change in price, all you do is you'd move along the curve in the same direction as the price. So again, if the price went from, say, this point which is $10 all the way up to this, which would obviously be higher at $100, you would move all the way along the curve. But you would just move along the curve because you're just changing how much you produce the quantity based on the price level. Um, feel free to ask questions about this in class if you're not quite sure. The other main way supply can change is called a shift in the supply curve. Okay, and What this basically means, as you see here, is that it's not a movement along the curve. It's the entire supply curve shifting, moving either to the right or to the left. Okay, So the entire curve moves. So here's what it looks like. Here is our initial supply line right here. And you can see the whole thing has shifted to the right. Okay, For some reason, we've gone from this line, S0, and the entire line has shifted to S1. And if you notice here, the price in the first graph is 30. But the price is also 30 in the second graph. Okay, so the price has not changed because, as we just said, if the price of the product changed, you would move up or down the curve. But in this case, it's not the price because price has stayed the same. But quantity has still gone from 30 units, or 3 million in this case, to 4 million units. Okay, it can also shift the other direction. It can shift. It can have a decrease in supply, where the shift is to the left. In this case, supply starting here in S1 has shifted in or to the left more accurately. Again, the price has stayed the same, that's why it's horizontal, but the price has gone from Q1, which say is 100, 
down to what Q2, which would be less than 100 or something like 50. Again, the key here is that you notice the difference between shifts and moving along the curve. And feel free, of course, to go back and look at it. Very quickly, let's go over the reasons there are supply shifts. Um, there are many. There are several reasons. There's one overriding reason, which is really the majority of the reason that is used, and that is here they are. The cost of production in purple is the main reason. Okay. What this basically means is that something has caused the cost of producing a product to either increase or decrease. Okay. So something has made it more expensive or less expensive to produce the product. Okay. What you see below here are three sub-reasons of what might cause that. So, cost of inputs. Very simply, obviously, any of the factors of production that are used to make the product. This can include, obviously, workers' wages, um, you know, raw materials, any sort of capital, um, you know, leasing of the factory. Anything that makes the cost go up or down will cause there to be a shift because, obviously, it doesn't matter what you're charging for the product, no matter if you're producing 10 units or a million units, if the cost of production changes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect the overall cost of producing those units. Productivity and technology are pretty straightforward. Obviously, if you can somehow get your workers to work more efficiently, you can produce more in the same time. Um, and we call that, obviously, we've talked about specialization of labor. That's what we do. Of course, if your workers slow down for some reason, that can have a negative effect on, on your cost of production. Okay. And technology, obviously, is pretty self-explanatory as well. That you know, if you have new technology that basically makes it more efficient, and you can produce more, you know, think of replacing workers with robots, that sort of thing, um, that makes you more efficient. Of course, if that technology breaks down, then you have a negative effect on cost production. Cost production goes up, and you shift to the left. There are several other reasons that you have um, supply shifts. Okay, the first one is government actions, and you can see here there's a few of them. Um, Taxes, pretty self-explanatory. If the government raises taxes, that's an increased cost to production. Okay, and of course, think about it. Can they pass those costs on to consumers? Only to a small degree, but of course, if if they do try to pass those on to consumers, consumers will move away from that product and buy something else because there's competition. Subsidies is the reverse of a tax. It's when the government gives money to producers to either produce more or less of a product. Um, the most obvious example I can talk about is farm prices. Um, it's, on average, the government gives farmers about a billion dollars to produce crops um, because we want them to produce a certain amount so we have enough money, enough crops for our society and it's obviously a necessity and we don't ever want to be without it. But farmers would not produce nearly as many crops if they weren't subsidized, if the government wasn't literally giving them money to encourage more production. Other one is government regulations. The government obviously requires certain tests to be done and certain a lot of what we call um, red tape to be filled out by companies. Okay, and this adds costs to production. Think of automobiles who test their cars, smash up these beautiful brand new cars to test to make sure they're safe. Okay, that costs millions of dollars to the car companies. Okay, that is a cost of production, but obviously we want them to do that because we want to know our product is safe. There are two other non cost of production um, items, and here they are. Number one is number of sellers, and it's very simple. If there are more sellers in a, a market, if a new company comes in that offers, let's say, sandwiches, okay, the, over number, the overall number of sandwiches available will go up, obviously. If, say, a bookstore goes out of business, that's one less place offering books, and the total supply of books will decline, and you'll shift to the left. Okay? Prices haven't changed because prices are still the same. Okay? Expectations... Okay, or, and this is just, just to clarify, expectations is basically it has to be a reasonable short-term event that will cause producers to change how much they produce. Um, as it shows you here, uh, Seasons is an excellent example. Okay, right now you can imagine certain companies that maybe like, um, that produce ski wear or anything for the skiing industry are beginning to produce more because they realize the weather is changing. And in the spring, it'll be the reverse, and obviously suntan lotion, swimsuit companies, things like that will begin to ramp up production where production of the skiing industry will go down. Okay, So this is the brief overview of supply. You know the definition of supply, you understand that you need to know the law of supply, and you also need to know a bit of the graphs and how they operate, both moving along the curve and the shifts. Uh, again, we'll be working a lot We'll be working with this stuff a lot in class, so please bring your questions, um, and we'll practice a lot more. Thanks, and have a good day. Bye-bye.